Okay, so hello everyone, welcome. I'm Ava Rispini, I'm the Barbara Lee Chief Curator at the ICA Boston, and I'm honored to be here with Zanella Moholy, who has joined us from South Africa uh, and is currently in a moving car. Um, we're so happy that you have all joined us. Hello, Moholy. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, so this is a 30 minute conversation. It's short but sweet, but an incredible opportunity to hear directly from the artist. Um, mm -hmm. Hardly needs an introduction and we have limited time, but for those of you who are not so familiar with their work, suffice it to say that Moholy is one of the most important photographers working today. Moholy lives and works in South Africa and their development as a photographer is deeply intertwined with their advocacy on behalf of the LGBTQI communities in South Africa and beyond. Moholy attended the renowned Market Photo Workshop in Johannesburg, established by the late great photographer David Goldblatt, and also earned an MFA in documentary media from Ryerson University in Toronto. They've exhibited their work in museums and galleries all over the world. I won't list them all here. You can look it up on the internet. But I do want to mention that a large exhibition survey opened um, at the Tate Modern in November. So the context of this conversation is newly acquired work um, that is on view at the ICA Boston right now. The ICA opened an exhibition from the collection that features photographs from Maholi's series titled Phases and Faces. So if you're in Boston and you feel safe to come in person at the museum, please do so. We encourage you to come and see Maholi's work in person. The internet's fantastic, but it is not a replacement for seeing artwork in person. So I want to start by asking Maholi, how are you? How have you been living through this pandemic and how do you find energy and inspiration in this moment? Uh, it's been slow. Uh, COVID slowed a lot of people. Um, and I don't know, we survived through the grace of God and um, we just give thanks for our lives and mourning those that we lost along the way, you know? Because as we're here, we can't forget that there are so many artists who have contributed towards the uh, art world and who have uh, suddenly passed without the world even knowing. So we just want to say we embrace and, uh, and thank them for all that they have done. This then goes beyond just me, you know? Yeah, so we survived. We're thankful. Yeah. Have you managed to make any work in this time? I tried, but it's been really, really hard. And I'm even getting slower and slower more than ever before. So all I did was just uh, to sleep a bit and feel the kind of exhaustion that I never had before. So I, I tried. I can't say I did my almost best, but I tried because I, I had to. I guess I owed it to myself. And that's... Um, that's acquire my work. So I tried of like out of nine months, you know, lockdown, uh, I produced maybe less than 20 images. Well, in my conversations with artists, I think, yeah, I think you're not alone. So many artists and, and you know, all of us, it's a moment to slow down uh, and, and even maybe rethink things. But in this moment, you have managed to open a major survey show at the Tate Modern, which is work in and of itself. Um, and I wonder, were you able to travel to, to London or how did that work for you? Um, I have not been able to travel. The show was meant to open in April and then it was postponed to uh, November uh, 7. And they shut down again and uh, it's going to reopen on the 2nd of December. So I'm, I'm in South Africa and I'm happy that I, I did not travel because life is better than, than travel. Yes. So I'm in South Africa as we speak and travel starts whenever it, it, it happens. But I'm in no rush because this period is much needed uh, for all of us. Agreed. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your work as a visual activist, because that's what you call yourself. And uh, I'm reminded about a quote from the artist Felix Gonzalez Torres, who said, I want a voice, not a career. And 
obviously, you know, this is a quote about using one's voice, using one's platform in an art as an artist. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how your work in photography promotes that goal. Um, I, I guess that it's simpler, just like uh, many other artists out there who might not use the term visual activist uh, per se, but who are um, consciously creating to bring about change in people's lives and surroundings. So it, it, it's all about that, like politically, to be politically correct and also to produce content that matter, um, especially at these trying times. It could either be work that speaks to or speaks or denounce racism, works that speaks to the importance of education, works that speaks to all the faculties and uh, disciplines that are out there in the world, from religion to ethnographies, to anthropologies, uh, to politics, uh, uh, etc. cetera. That, 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 that's all about the work that's, that I produce at this period to say that inclusivity is very important, diversity important, uh, which then speaks to all the activisms that is connected to the art world and academia, uh, et cetera. So if I speak about visual activism, I'm speaking to the work or the creations that matter to me and many other people who are consuming the work that I produce. So we're speaking at a period where racism is rife, where homophobia and all the isms and, and, and transphobia and queerphobia is rife. So when one produces work, we are saying no to all that cripples or violates the next person. So maybe we could start by talking about Phases and Faces, which is, you know, I would say your foundational body of work, a series from which you became widely known. So you started the series in 2006. And as I said, I think it's the series of, from which you really become known. I remember the first time I saw it, and I'll go back to this image because it really is a kind of archive that you have created now over so many years, an archive that's, I think, powerful when I saw it and continues to be powerful now. Um, but maybe you can talk a little bit about how it began. Um, Faces and Faces began when I work for FEW, which is an organization that I co-founded. And in the organization, we had a lot of individuals who identify as uh, uh, women who loved women. And I thought to myself that that series was needed at that time to celebrate the lives of those people who were brave enough to come out and say that they were or that they are. And also to thank them for even speaking out at a period where violence was rife in South Africa, especially to those bodies who were out there in the open. This is 2006, which is the same year when South Africa legalized same-sex marriages or Civil Union Act of 2006 in South Africa, where same-sex partners were given the right to marry. So then this period um, was very important. And the very same period celebrated 10 years of South African constitution, where we were talking about equality clause uh, of, of um, of South Africa looking at May 1990, when the constitution was amended to include the right of LGBTIs, unlike in other countries in Africa. And we have the clause enshrined in our constitution that say you are protected as a human being in your country of origin. So, and then 2006 then became that period in which I wanted to do something, to contribute something, to create an archive that could live beyond us. And it started with less than 30 images. And then the following year, it became bigger. And then in 2008, it was even bigger than before. And unfortunately, what happened in 2006, one of the uh, women that I documented uh, passed on uh, the following year, she came out as uh, uh, HIV positive 
and she wrote a piece that was called please uh, remember me when I, um, I'm gone and it became that uh, opening piece of faces and faces because she was speaking on that very same you know uh, a topic of speaking with that voice of wanted to be remembered not to be forgotten for the work that we did so as i say it's a celebration it's a commemoration of somebody and many others in which we say we were once here or those who will come after us will have that reference point looking back at what existed before then so we lost a friend in 2007 in march um and did a the archive started in 2006. That's how I wanted to celebrate, to remember the friend and many others that came before her and many others that came, you know, before us, whose lives and whose voices were never, you know, written in any books or published in anything, and whose voices were so strong, but because of silence and exclusion, they ended up not being documented or being counted in a, a visual history of this country. And yet they are citizens of, 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 of South Africa. So that's how it started to remember a friend, Bosi Sigasa is a name, and many other heroines that came before us, whose voices were never penned down and, and never heard, and yet they were once here. It's really beautiful, the idea of a kind of, you know, a, a memory or in memory of someone that this amazing series, you know, really began there. One of the things that I really love about these photographs is how your sitters, your subjects, I know you call them participants, are really confronting you, the photographer, us, the viewer, that you, this gaze, most often it's directly into our, our, our eyes, has a real power and grace and beauty to it. And you've talked about your relationship with many of these subjects that you don't call them subjects, you call them participants. So there is an idea of a collaboration, which, you know, of course, in the history of photography, there's always been a kind of imbalance of power sometimes between the photographer and those who are then photographed. So I'd like to hear some more from you about why you call them participants and how you see this collaboration with those that you photograph. You know, you know, um, with many people, they call sitter subjects. Those S's don't, uh, you know, they're not part of my vocab. I just want to say that these are very important individuals in my work, in our work. They don't just see it, but they contribute a great deal in a project that um, overlive or that, 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 that continues. So they can't just be... Um, lower than the, the, the standard of the photographer. The photographer is being made by them. Hence, I call them participants in a project that is very, very important, in a historical project, in an educational project, and a transactional project. So it's very, very important to regard them, to recognize them, and to give them some respect where it's due. So yeah, and I think this particip participation, partaking, it, it has a lot to do with their prominence in this, in this um, ongoing uh, uh, project. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, this body of work calls into question who gets visualized, who gets recorded in history. And, and it does, I also, you know, read somewhere that you talked about bringing change into spaces that are queer phobic. The idea of bringing these portraits and bringing these individuals into spaces, which I know is brave, that the violence faced by the LGBTI communities is real. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how does it feel to see these photographs in museums across the world and spaces, you know, very different than perhaps the spaces they were made. I, I didn't get that, your question, please. Repeat. How, how does it feel to see these pictures in museums across the world? Um, it, it, it's healing. It's such a relief because 
uh, many black people who never seen like black faces in any museum or galleries, they get to see themselves. So those who are not like familiar with the settings of those museums and the galleries, if they see like a number of these portraits, they see themselves, they see their likenesses, they know that it's possible to be there, not just to be, you know, that subject hung on the wall, but to have their own voices being included in those museums and also to see like possibilities and, and, and see their own future projects if they take photographs, if they um, create any artworks and to, to take notes, to, to say that this is me or these are the people who look like me. And one day I will see my, my work also you know, uh, uh, being part of those uh, spaces. Because, I mean, it's, it's, it's a known fact. Historically, for the longest time, Black bodies were excluded in a number of museums. Even the artworks that maybe was produced coming from Africa, not many people knew how it was acquired. So now, bit by bit, things are changing and people are becoming, you know, to be part of those settings or to be included in those uh, spaces because of the, the change that is taking place uh, at, uh, at this period. So for me, it's, it's, it's healing because for the longest time, one felt so bruised to think that this, we're talking about violence, but it means that the future is bright, even at this darkest period, but then change will bring more, 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 more of our people in those settings and, you know, proper dialogues and progress will then take, take, take place. I have to say your optimism is quite inspiring. Uh, it really is, especially in these moments where we need, we need, I think, to believe in something a bit bigger than ourselves. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a more recent body of work. I'll show, oh, here's still Faze and Faces. Um, but a more recent body of work, which is titled Somnyana Gonyama, I hope I got that right, which translates in English to Hail the Dark Lioness. And with these photographs, you are turning the camera on yourself uh, to create a series of vividly expressive self-portraits. And many of these pictures reference your ancestry, symbolism of African women throughout history. And the series is dedicated to your mother. Um, and maybe we've lost you, Moholi, are you still there? I'm hearing you pretty well. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about the decision to photograph yourself with this series and to turn the camera on yourself. Mm -hmm. um, for the longest time, I photographed uh, uh, my likenesses, and then um, and then it came a period where I just like questioned uh, my existence in all of these um, in all of these uh, projects. So now I started like photographing myself because I realized that um, there were so many all that I do and starting with my mother and many other black women in history that were never counted uh, in anything so I wanted to make a reference you know uh, doc and then Somyama Gonyama becomes that in which I speak against um, what I don't see again and then it leads to that visual activism to say that to see and to project and to bring forth what is not often seen using uh, basic materials that are often used by, by women or at work to create images made sense. So I produced Somnya Mangunyam, which then became once again, one of the most important uh, visual talk of, 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 of my lifetime. Um, and I'm continuing to produce this project to challenge, to express, to speak out, to relate, to reference, and do all the kind of things that are done when people uh, create 
uh, photographs or make photographs. So for memory's sake, here goes the, the very same uh, project and it's titled Somia Mangonyama and uh, translated as um, Hail the Dark Lioness, where you give praises, you know, uh, to oneself or to the other and all those that are important to you. Uh, named in Zulu, which happened to be my uh, vernacular or my first language. Mm -hmm. and, and all the names have meanings. And the images were taken in different parts of the world where I happen to be at. And speaking also uh, uh, to personal experience or challenging all that did not make sense. Um, and one of those challenges, like the existence of, 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 of my mother who was a helper slash domestic worker who faced so many challenges, who faced a number of um, uh, racial experiences in her lifetime. And I, br I brought her forth into this, even though she's late, but she became my reference you know, point. And then there are other experiences that I faced along the way, and I'll produce an image to speak on that particular uh, issue or that experience. And use the, the, the Zulu names, which related, if I would say, um, it, it's a Zulu uh, word, and which means that we are all that we are, you know, or we are everything, you know, and it speaks to all those that people, they know that there is a black woman that exists, but for her to feature in a magazine, she has to do an extraordinary something just to feature. And if there's tragedy, she also featured because people needed something to resonate with or to speak about or to read about. So I just needed to produce those beautiful black images, use my own body as own subject, not somebody's subject uh, and, and start a new dialogue. Why is it important for us to uh, touch on self-representation? What is or what are the politics of self-representations? What is the meaning of self in all of this mess? That, that's, that's how I did it. I'll travel with my camera wherever I go. I'll be in any hotel room and capture images without using any artificial light or whatsoever. Um, reflector in my bag, if at all, or use any basic material that, 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 that is found in those spaces. Um, in that way, it became like successful because there was not much preservative used to make that particular document. But I wanted to speak out. I wanted to make sure that another black face, another uh, feminine self person sees themselves in this uh, uh, self portrait. Uh, yeah. And now um, I'm, I've started the masculine uh, part that speaks to, you know, the mixed genders in spaces and what people face in, in, in their daily uh, lives. And what I could say with Somia Mangonyama, it was meant to be for 365 days. I wanted to shoot daily. And daily. I, yeah, at the beginning I was hyped up. I was excited, I was on it and and it just turned out to be the most unnerving experience ever. <laughs> I crashed. Oh. I had this burnout that I had when I was still active as an activist back then. And I got so exhausted. And for the next maybe like month or so, I won't even touch a camera because I was so exhausted to see the very same self. 
and to take a lot of images. What I achieved was maybe about like 250 images. I'm still short of 100 plus. Though what has been captured of Somyama is more than like 500, but due to editing, I had to drop down the number to make sure that it was good images, quality involved, and uh, for me to reach that 365, it meant that it was high quality work that is easy for one to read than to repeat uh, myself. So I'm still going on slowly. And uh, in time, I will get my 365. Well, I love how immediate the photographs are. You know, one that we have on the screen right now. I mean, you talked about this, how you use anything at hand to create these amazingly beautiful photographs. And, you know, here you have a crown made out of clothespins. You have earrings made out of clothespins, a, a kind of shawl. I don't know if it's a blanket or, or a, a garment, but you know, I love how you, with whatever is at hand and as you described when you were traveling, you would just make these pictures, but yet you're able to create these incredibly powerful pictures with, with seemingly nothing. And to, to me, that's quite inspirational. And it kind of leads me to my final question which is about the young people that we have many young people that live in Boston because it's a town of universities and colleges um, and there are many queer and non-binary people in our community who wanna change the world, who wanna see change um, and may be frustrated by the trenchant injustices towards people in the LGBTQI communities and people of color. So, what would you like to say to those young people who might be with us today who want to see change? Um, uh, let me touch on the picture that you're talking about. Those are sure. clothes pins or pegs. And then, um, and I, I use that material because most people who do not have maybe washing machines and so on, and women and work, they're familiar with them. And then what I have over my shoulders is the doormat. <laughs> And I, I bought that doormats for two euros and I bought those those pins maybe for three euros. Um, so the material that I'm wearing there is about like five euros in all. The image was taken in Mayotte, which is one of the French regions uh, uh, in Comoran Islands. And it's one of the, uh, it's, 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 it's a country in Africa that was previously colonized by the French. And it's one country that still uses a euro, which is a foreign currency. And that has a lot to do with colonialism and its impacts on us as, as, as black people. But um, that's just to mention. Right. When we talk about like arts and creation and changing spaces, let's just drop the H because there are so many artists who never had the opportunities that young people are having today. A lot of great artists in history who never had, who are, who are good artists, who will never maybe have an opportunity to showcase their work in any museum or in any galleries. Let's talk about like human beings who mm. want to see uh, something or, or art lovers rather, to say that change is all about us and we all what we want to become. And if we could come together as human beings, brainstorm, maybe collaborate and share some ideas and thoughts uh, to create, to prosper, and also to get to some spaces and, 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 and lend a hand to all those who want to achieve something, you know, who want to create something. Even if it's like um, hosting um, meetings and have small workshops where people will know that it's okay to create and it's okay to say something, it's okay to share one's art wealth. And that's wealth meaning what you're able to create, what you're proud of, what you, you know for sure makes sense to you. And to undo all the criticism 
which on its own is violence, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and also to say to people, let's come together, let's do something, let's heal together, let's produce something and share with the world. Because with that particular uh, art piece, it will heal the next person who might be in pain, who might be going through some traumatic, you know, experience. So it could be, because I'm talking to creatives here, I'm not talking to a young person to an older person, but like to human beings who care about next, you know, humans or other people who are in their surroundings. Let's keep on going on. Let's care for each other. Let's speak out with all that we are producing because it matters. Regardless of how old you are, regardless of your skin color, let's just be sensitive and be sensible and let's use art, you know, to challenge all the isms, all violence, you know, that is out there because it's so unnecessary. Wow. Amazing words to live by, Moholi. I think we've come to the end of our talk. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if your internet um, is good enough, I would love to be able to wave goodbye to you and to thank you for your time and for joining all of us today. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who's listening. Um, hopefully one day we'll meet. Yeah, yes. also to say that I'll be having an exhibition at ISGM in a, in a year from now. And there's a lot of beautiful work that I produced when I was on residency at Isabel Gardner Stewart Museum. So for those who are in the surroundings, check it out and I'll be, we'll be hosting workshops, sharing creative knowledges, etc. Wonderful, we can't wait. Well, thank you, Maholi. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And I hope to see you soon. Stay safe and be healthy. Bye. Same, same to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.